So, welcome to the Books and Music show. I'm glad to have you back again on the Books and Music show. And we have, Gerard here is going to do a fabulous show on, I believe the topic is free speech. Over to you, Gerard. Uh, thank you for that, that great introduction. Uh, yeah, today we're going to be talking about free speech in broadly but also uh, specific, specific cases of um, speech infringement and wh why this debate is so important. So in the news lately, you've, you've heard about a lot of cases of people, uh, speakers at different college campuses being attacked and uh, abused or or uh, e even prevented from, from speaking at certain campuses. What amounts to a heckler's veto, the, the, the idea of a heckler's veto is someone, a person or usually a group of people preventing another, pers uh, another person from speaking because they disagree with their point of view on a particular subject. So even even though the government in in that case isn't suppressing speech, the speech is being uh, suppressed effectively by the actions of individuals when and this is what what people um when people get into a discussion of censorship, a lot of a lot of people who uh, who disagree with a particular point of view, let's say a conservative speaker or a libertarian speaker comes to campus and they are prevented from speaking or uh, shouted down, or, a lot of people will say that this technically isn't censorship because censorship is censorship is the government infringing on your right to 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 speak. To speak, to uh, peaceably assemble, like uh, to give to, to give an example. During World War One, people were prevented, imprisoned uh, for speaking out against the war. There was this, this huge hysteria, this huge uh, anti-German pro-war hysteria after Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson decided to enter. Enter, enter the war on the side of uh, the Allies. And people, people, were, um, pe people were actually uh, punished for, for speaking out against the war. People like Norman Thomas, the leader of the Socialist Party, and pacifists who disagreed with the decision they were, they were prosecuted and served um, Serve jail sentences, some, some of them lengthy, because they spoke up against the war, and that was, that was probably that's probably one of the best examples of government infringement on, on the First Amendment, and you've had you've had other examples of that, uh, as well. But one of the earliest was the Alien and Sedition Acts when. The government. Uh, the Federalist Party, which was in, in charge of the government, decided to uh, punish critics who were uh, who were um, who were the they were called the Democrat Republicans, the people who were pro pro France and uh, anti anti Great Britain, and the, the the government decided to punish these people by limiting curtailing their right to speak and um, punishing people they did, they they saw as uh, foreign uh, seditious elements and these are th those are just two of uh, the most prominent examples of the government suppressing free speech but a another way of stifling free speech is is as I said, the heckler's veto, using your, using your your, uh, f 
using force of numbers or your um, or in order to intimidate or or stop someone from from speaking. And some people who disagree with these speakers say that this technically is in censorship. And the problem is there's not there's not a a clear term to delineate between when the government oppress it, the government is suppressing your your speech and when when your your right to speak or to assemble is being suppressed by a non-governmental group uh, a group of individuals or collective that's not uh, not not that doesn't have the imprimatur of of the government but it's still it's still a a violation of the, the spirit of the of the first amendment and there are a lot of cases of this happening recently for example there's one there was a professor at Evergreen State University which is a very uh, kind of a progressive radical campus in Washington which has a lot of student activism and there is a professor there uh, named Brett Weinstein and he's gotten a lot of uh, publicity lately because he he refused to accede to the demands of a group of college students who wanted all of the professors to stop teaching essentially to stop um, to close down their classes um, because and, and the reason the reason behind th this this movement was because the the, um, the the teachers essentially it's it's hard to um, explain the the backstory, but it was essentially because they were white. They 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 were um, they thought that you know the campus was discriminating against um, against black people and uh, mi minorities and non-white students, so they. They they wanted to shut down. Um, they they effectively wanted to shut down the campus, and Brett Weinstein refused. And he was a, he was a kind of forced to forced to leave the campus, even though he wasn't fired. He wasn't um, the university itself. The faculty did um, the administration didn't punish him. He was still forced to leave campus because of uh, a group of radical students who refused to let uh, a small group of students who refused to let the the rest of the campus learn and um, and attend lectures in order to make their uh, make their uh, racial or political grievances um, predom predominant uh, so uh, the university actually wound up set, settling with him uh, later on after after this incident, but uh, the upshot is that, that the university lost a very competent, skilled professor because of the insistent insistence that a, a small group of uh, radical students be satisfied, even if even. If it was to the detriment of the the rest of the student body, and it's not just the it's not just the faculty and the the, 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 the students on campus who are uh, suffering. I think I think the um, the broader uh, body politic is suffering since these are these people. These students are be, are graduating to a world where they they have to grapple with different political perspectives, and they're not really be, being 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 uh, given an opportunity to uh, to engage engage in debate. Now, there there are some people like there's um, there's a professor in Canada at, at a Canadian university who. Who, who, who uh, said that the, this is a mischaracterization of what's what's happening? That that, that 
the college environment is, suppo is supposed to be a cocoon where people aren't challenged repeatedly by, um, by uh, political philosophies and, and points of view that, that contradict what they believe, that it's supposed to be an isolated kind of oasis, which is, is a puzzling way of describing college when you think of, think of the think of what a traditional liberal arts education is supposed to be, it's, it's predicated to a certain extent on immersing yourself in, in different points of view, not just um, like classical, um, not just classical philosophy and historical perspectives, but also, but also beliefs that challenge, you know, what, what you might, that, that, that challenge your, your preconceptions. I mean, it's, and when you're, when you prevent people from, from teaching or, or teaching anything that, that might contradict what, um, what a student believes, you're, you're, you're kind of interrupting learning, but even, uh, but, and even, um, even more so, you're, you're, you're kind of diminishing the, uh, the potency, the, the uh, of the, the, the first, uh, the First Amendment, like, it, it's, it's sort of what undergirds our society, the the ability to speak and to uh, assemble and speak freely and debate, and when you have people who can't be, you who can't uh, who can't talk basically because a, a group of um, a group of radicals who prevent them from from speaking, you're you're undermining the foundation of of the country. And there's a there's a great interview of a Peruvian writer, uh, Maria Mario uh, Vargas Llosa, who who uh, speaks about the, this topic. Even though he's not he's not from the United States, he has a lot of insight into uh, the radicalization of um, of uh, students and how that has a wider impact upon society. So he, he, there's the interview was was uh, conducted with uh, El, El Pais, which is a Spanish newspaper, uh, a very popular uh, Spanish newspaper, oh, but, but it was translated into English. And he's discussing um, his, own, his own life as a, as a student and how he was a radical. He was um, uh, he was a he was a he was kind of a Marxist. And he says uh, I started at the National University of San Marcos with the idea that there would be communists I could mix with. Um, but the communism in Latin America was pure Stalinism with parties subject to the common turn in Moscow. I was only militant for a year. And then he, he goes on to describe his uh, evolution, his political evolution. How he went to Cuba, and he, he criticized uh, the Castro regime and questioned uh, Fidel Castro and what he was doing, doing to the country. Uh, you know, putting people in the, the equivalent of um, concentration camps or gulags for their political opinions. And he... And he uh, describes his how this worked, how the, how all these uh, events kind of um, altered his his political thinking. And later on in the interview, he, he goes on to describe. He he talks about this. Uh, he he makes the connection between um, between uh, these these the student ferment and. You know what, what you're seeing on, on um, college campuses today, and I think there is a, there really is a, a certain, a certain connection when you look at events in um, the United States, and 
the, the uh, Tomo that you saw in the 1960s, not just in the United States, but also in um, places like Paris and France, where you had students taking taking o take, uh, taking over faculty buildings and just um, uh, sometimes even rioting in order to in order to affect their demands for more control over the university uh, curriculum and what's what's taught in universities and and uh, conversely what isn't taught so uh, a lot of the things that are excluded from universities are a lot of the ideas are excluded because of the demands of students uh, for example in Stanford University there were protests about there were protests against the Western Civ curriculum and it and as a result they they, they basically jettisoned the Western civilization curriculum large large parts of it studies study of Shakespeare and and other uh, classical uh, European authors. And this was in 19, 1992, almost um, two, two and a half decades ago. So it's not, this isn't, um, this isn't a recent phenomenon. This is just a, kind of a crystallization of something that's been happening for, for years and has probably come about now because of um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Come about because of the political environment, the the um, fact that there's a, a backlash against against the um, liberal uh, political ideas. So, so you see on college campuses kind of a counter counter reaction, kind of kind of a counter reaction by people by um, students who are used to being cocooned in this sort of environment where their ideas aren't really, aren't really challenged. And, and you can, um, and you can uh, see the, you can see the, what, ha what happens when this is really, when, when, when this sort of, when this sort of phenomena, phenomenon isn't 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 really challenged, you don't you don't necessarily uh, descend into totalitarianism, but you have this sort of slippery slippery slope where where these actions are condoned, and then uh, it escalates to the point where you have. People being physically assaulted for expressing their views. For example, when Charles Murray went to Middlebury, went to Middlebury um, University uh, to speak, he was. They had to cordon. They had to. Um, they, they couldn't actually have the discussion in a. In an auditorium or a, a venue where, where students could see him, they had to they had to tape a discussion between him and one of the the, the professor who invited him, and show it via remote link. They had to upload it to the internet, and the students were able to watch it that, that way. But they couldn't hold it in an auditorium because it would have been disrupted, and he would have and. Even so, even even though they took precautions to prevent any sort of violence, he was still he and the professor were still assaulted, and the professor was sent to the hospital for uh, a concussion when they left the um, when when they left the building where they were uh, filming this uh, recording this interview. So. You have people who were who were physically assaulting uh, physically assaulting uh, professors and writers and political political activists 
because of their point of view, which is this sort of sort of environment that is really ripe for really ripe for um, authoritarianism and just this sort of dystopian political outcome where people don't resolve their differences through debate or through elections or any sort of um, uh, any sort of non uh, non authoritarian uh, vehicle it, where they, where they just resolve it through violence and um, you know physical coercion and it's not and I I think the problem is actually getting worse when you look at surveys of of college students in particular they're attitudes about whether or not free speech should be criminalized are very, very troubling, because a lot of them actually do want to penalize people for, for speech that uh, they consider hate speech, or, or um, even, even though the idea of hate speech isn't really specified, they want to punish people for 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 speech that they consider they deem to be um, hate speech or even even not necessarily uh, hate speech but speech that is um, that is that, that they oppose so you ha you have people who are of voting age and who are graduating into a world of um, well, a world where 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 this is the norm on on college campuses, and the idea that you could uh, that you the idea that some people hold that you could contain it simply to college campuses is kind of kind of absurd when you think uh, about the um, when you think about the influence that uh, these students are going to have once they graduate. And take these ideas with them into the um, into into the wider world. So, I mean, the the, the I'm not sure exactly where the where this is headed. A lot of there 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 are groups of people groups of people who are um, trying to roll back this. This tide of, uh, for, for lack of a better word, censorship. There's a group called the Foundation for Individual Rights and in, in Education, which is a free speech group that's been fighting these sorts of um, encroachments on on speech since the early '90s, and they re regularly regularly fight against against uh, so-called um, or what are called speech speech codes which are essentially restrictions on when and where you can speak within a college campus now there are a lot of you know, there's there, there's a, a there's a distinction between private and public universities and the fact that if you, you're you're at a public university the 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 administration really has no right to restrict what what you say or when you say it beyond um, beyond disruptive speech. Uh, you, in other words, trying trying to prevent classes, uh, trying to prevent um, professors from from teaching. But the um, the problem is a lot of a lot of these a, a lot of the suppression of, of speech isn't happening s simply because of the administration or at the behest of the administration. It's happening because of the because the students are driving 
driving this campaign. They're, they're the ones, the students, in some cases, people off campus who aren't, aren't students who are attacking and uh, trying to trying to deny people their their right uh, their free speech rights so while while you while uh, the while groups like fire are successful to a certain degree in fighting back fighting back um, university speech codes and speech restrictions that are imposed by imposed by the administration of, of these colleges and universities, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, fight back against students who are actively trying to, trying to stifle free speech and to create this uh, sort of homogenous, uh, monolithic, uh, politically monolithic culture on their campuses. Four minutes. It's 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 hard to to fight against a majority, or even if it's not a majority, a very vocal and aggressive uh, minority who are intent on not listening to any sort of uh, any sort of contrary opinions. So um, I think it, it it's going to be. It's going to be difficult in to, to fight this sort of um, this sort of grassroots uh, movement, but on on a on a positive note, I think the fact that people like Brett Weinstein and and some other professors, the the, the professor at NYU, who is um, who is resisting this this movement and has written about and has written about it on his own um, website and uh, used social media to to fight back against the anti speech uh, crusaders. I think the fact that these people are becoming more more prominent because of social media and the internet. And having their their voices shared with not just um, not just their students, but people outside of the campus, the university environment, the fact that it's this message is being disseminated so widely is is a, is positive, and uh, and I think it's a good thing in the long run to make people aware of what's what's happening on, um, on college campuses, particularly uh, parents who, uh, who are making these important decisions about where, where in, in, in concert with their children, about where they, where they want to go to, um, where they want to go to college. And uh, I think the, this is one of the main, um, Main reasons why someone sh should uh, think critically about where they want, where they want to, um, what university or college they want to attend, because if the college that you're attending doesn't respect the basic idea of um, the First Amendment, they don't really have a good, they, they don't really have a good good idea of, of um, what the mission of. Co uh, of uh, the university is. So, just to wrap things up, I, I, I think I think people should get be more uh, involved in this issue at a at a at a, at a, at a kind of um, a grassroots level and just just get more information and try to um, try to understand the issues uh, and. And understand why the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights is so important, and why the the preservation is dependent to a large degree on 
on, on people who are in colleges right now, who are, I mean, young people. So that's just my opinion. Um, you can do it for yourselves, and uh, we'll be joining you soon.